Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Darlene with Digital Photo Mentor and this is my weekly live stream of photo editing. So today I am going to edit some subscriber images that have been submitted to me because what I am going to do is to show you through the demonstration of processing these photos of how I approach the photo editing process, what I would do to the, each of the images and why as well. Because a lot of questions I get about photo editing, especially from beginners is, I don't know where to start, what should I do to this image and how do I know when it's finished? So um, if you are joining for the first time, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and then you won't miss anything. You'll always get notice of new videos, but I do this every week at this time. So please subscribe and set yourself a notification to send yourself a reminder of when this happens so that you can join in. We've got quite a few regulars that join us often and I'm just gonna hop over here to the chat area so Ron is often with us. There's his lovely kitty. Hi, Ron. And uh, I believe he's in Australia. Kelly is often here. And uh, I uh, don't quote me, but I think he, she's in Calgary. Um, tell me where you're joining from. And if you are just joining in from wherever, tell us where in the world you are situated and what brought you here today. I'd also love to hear from everybody about what type of photo editing software you use if you are currently processing your image images. So I'm gonna dig in and uh, keep chatting here. I'm gonna hop over to my Lightroom and we will get started. Okay, I'm back in Lightroom now. Um, we've got Vivian from St. Louis. And I think what's happening is it says Facebook user, but I'm going to um, assume that somebody in our Facebook group, uh, because there's something about sharing uh, comments from the inside the group that StreamYard, I posted the information on how to come um, with your name coming up on the screen. I think you have to go to either my stream feed or the page so the digital photo mentor page as opposed to the group something to do with securities and so on aha i got it right yes calgary <laughs> no worries uh using lightroom kelly's using lightroom and uh, deb's in alaska awesome great to hear from you jenny in australia so once again we have got um an international audience we it's morning sometime in australia i'm assuming and it's 6 p.m here in western canada so i've got a few images um i'm hoping that trish is here and that nancy is here or that they will be because i've got their images and their questions so i'm going to start with somebody else's image until i see their names of course, Nigel's here and he's in the Bahamas, I believe, Barbados, maybe, Nigel. I know he's in the Bahamas. Um, Wellington, New Zealand, middle of the day. <laughs> no worries. Great. Um, okay, I think this is you, Nancy. Either that's you, Nancy, or Trish. So uh, pop in your name if that is one of you ladies. So I'm going to start with this image which is an image created by one of my tutoring students regan um she's got fabulous animals on her on her property and they have like a horse acreage and ranch and this is one image that i wanted to pull some detail out because this is a common um issue where you have the subject is in the dark and the sky is overly bright so i've already done some tone control on this and i'm going to show you how i did that to bring out the horse and darken the sky. And then also some uh, challenges that show up when you start to do these kinds of things. We'll take a look at chromatic aberration and fringing. <laughs> hey, my friend Alisa is here. Hi, Alisa. I've seen her do live videos before. So now the, the, the um, tide is turned or opposite. So you get to watch me today. Yay. All right, so I'm gonna start with this image of the horse and I am using Lightroom. Majority of the workflow that I do is Lightroom is probably about 90% of my workflow. Actually, it's starting to be a bit less and I'm using more and more Luminar and I pull things into Luminar to do some extra editing and enhancements often. I'm working on a project right now where I photograph these 10 wonderful women and I've been pulling all of them into Luminar to do some finished editing. So I want to kind of show you what I've done here. 
If you've watched my videos before, you'll know that I often um, talk about changing the camera profile, right? So the camera profile is something that um, if you're photographing in your camera, you'll be able to sit these picture styles. So I can tell based on the kind of camera that she used, these are the styles. Now I know that she shoots Canon as well. So even if she shot in the standard, picture style, I could change it to one of these others. Now you'll see that just by moving my mouse over, the landscape one is a lot more um, punchy and vibrant. So I might actually switch to that one. Portrait, um, portrait profiles tend to have more uh, red or orange because they're trying to pick up the skin tone, which might work well for this horse because he's a bit on the orange side or brown. Neutral, kind of blah. Okay, so I'm either gonna go with the landscape or the portrait. Okay, so landscape brings out the orange real nice and the blue sky has gone a little bit too crazy, but we can easily tone that down. Okay, so that's probably one of the first things that I do. Then I do some basic adjustments in the first panel. So if you're in Lightroom, that's the one at the top right here, right? You'll notice that when I open one of my panels, the other one closes. If you don't see that on your Lightroom, just right click. Now I right clicked on the panel itself, okay? and choose solo mode, okay? So then what will happen is it'll only show one panel at a time. And when I'm working on a laptop and I have limited real estate here for space on my laptop, that's really helpful. I always make sure to show the histogram because I want to see if things are going off the graph. And you can also use the clipping warning, which is a keyboard shortcut J. And what that shows me is any areas that are highlighted in blue are clipping on the black side, meaning there's no detail in those areas of black. And anything that is highlighted in red, which there's none right now, but I'm just going to do this to show you what happens. Okay, so now that means that those areas up in the clouds have no detail in the white. Okay, so that's clipping. Let me just undo that. So I've done, done a lot of work to not have clipping in the sky, so let's not add some. So what I do is I pull the whites and the blacks up um, so that I get spread out the original histogram. I'm just going to do a quick reset for you to show you what the original histogram looked like. Okay, I also cropped in this image quite a bit. As you can see, I took some from the left and I took some from the bottom as well. I didn't want to have as much of these sort of crates in the image. And I changed the camera profile, but look at this histogram. So what this tells us, the histogram represents the different tones in the image. So the left being black and the right being white. And what this is showing us is there's a lot of dark and black tones, a lot of white and just, un just slightly darker than white tones and not a lot in the middle. Okay, so I've done a lot of work to process this image to bring out some of those mid-tones, okay? So some of what I've done is in here by pulling the highlight slider down and the shadow slider up, but I also did a lot of what's called a local adjustment, okay? So I'm using the radio filter, which is this one right here, and you can get to any of these up in the tools menu. You can see there are keyboard shortcuts for each of them as well or clicking on these tools up here. Okay, so it's the radio filter that I'm using. And I've placed two different ones, okay? When you hover over it, it will highlight in red for you or whatever color you're using for your overlay, which part of the image is being affected. So I've actually applied a range mask on this one to just affect the brown tones or the orange tones of the horse, right? So it's only affecting those colors. Let me turn that on. Okay, so if I slide this here, the range, I can either get more specific with the color or include a few more colors. Okay, so I'm going to actually increase it a little bit. And inside of this graduated uh, radio filter, sorry, I've increased the exposure plus shadows plus whites minus blacks plus a lot of texture and plus clarity. Okay, so if I zoom in a little bit on this horse, Okay. I want to show you what this is doing if I turn this radio filter off. Okay, so it's brightening him. I'm assuming it's a him. But it's also adding texture. Okay? And if I just use the shadow slider and not some of these others, it starts to look flat. Okay. So if I, let's just change this here. If I get rid of that and the whites and the blacks. So if all I do is increase the shadows, it just starts to look flat. Okay. So I do a lot with the sliders on my radio filter to really keep the contrast inside of this 
little circle, right? So it's not just increase the shadows, I'm increasing the blacks and the whites as well within this, this small area. Within the other one that I've added, I'm actually applying it to the outside of the circle, okay? So you can invert it here, okay? So you can always tell where your mask is applying if you hit O on the keyboard. Rob, if you could please share um, a link to the article and the, the um, article about the Lightroom keyboard shortcuts for people to download that. Uh, hey, Daniel from uh, Florida, our buddy Daniel Korzanowski is watching. Always good to have you watching it, watching Daniel. You guys make me nervous. Okay, so if you want the overlay to show, just press O on your keyboard. And I've got it showing in red, but you can also use other colors as well. So if you have shift and O press down, you'll be able to toggle through different colors. Okay, so there's red, green, white, and black. I find that the red um, shows up the best against most images. And on this area, I'm applying, lowered the highlights, lowered the exposure, and boosted the shadows just a little bit. Okay, so the combination of these two radio filters, and I also applied one to the tops of each of the barrels to lower those highlights, okay? So I'm gonna turn the radio filters off and you can see what those are doing, okay? So it's brightening the horse, darkening the areas around, and then darkening those barrels, okay? And I could go a little farther if I wanted to. I also did mask those, okay? So when I darken, you'll see that it's not applying to the whole circle, it's really only applying here on these are areas that are red because I've done a luminance mask, okay? So luminance mask allows me to say, okay, I don't want it to apply that whole circle, take it off the blacks as I slide this up, okay? So I just want that inside of that drum to be affected, the white part, okay? I could actually lower the saturation, I could lower, um, I could bring the whites down, I could lower the contrast, I could bring the clarity down. So lots of things I can do to take attention away from the white tops of these of these barrels because I don't want them to grab attention from the horse, right? So let me get out of the radio filter. I also applied a couple of different graduated filters. Okay, so I applied one to the sky and I'm darkening the highlights and the exposure. And I also did minus clarity because the clouds are already a little blurry. So I wanted to just blur them a little bit more. But you'll notice that when I pull this down from the top, okay, it's going to apply over the horse, uh, over part of his face and the, the trees. So by applying this luminance mask, okay, if I increase it up, you can see the full mask. But as I drag it away from this range on the right, on the left, pardon me, um, this range on the left is the same as a histogram. Okay, so it's black on the left. So by dragging this range mask up, I'm removing it from those dark areas. Okay, so now I'm just affecting the sky. And then I did a similar thing in the bottom here without the range mask, just to apply um, some darkening minus exposure at the bottom. Okay, again, to take away from um, those crates to bring the, the attention up to the horse. Okay, so let me turn the radio filters off. Okay, so you can see without, sorry, graduated filters. Okay, graduated filters come in from the top or the bottom or the edge always. Okay, when I turn them on, you'll see that when I move them, they're always from the side up. Okay, radio filters is more of a circle and you can place it anywhere. Okay, so graduated filters are doing great things to the top and the bottom. Okay, so that's where I've gone with this image with a few adjustments. I've also done some um, things down here where I've done some lens corrections. Now, if you're using Luminar, they do have these things as well. All right, so what I've done is I'm just going to undo this. Okay, so chromatic aberration and defringe. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in on the horse's ears right here. So chromatic aberration, I've talked about this before. Um, you'll see it at the edge of things and what it looks like is a color fringe. So you might see, like here you can see is a little bit of purple kind of thing. Okay, so just by clicking this box, remove chromatic aberration, and I'm gonna enable the profile for this lens, I'm gonna eliminate a lot of that problems, right? And it actually makes your image look sharper, okay? The next thing I wanna do is do this manual correction, which is defringe. 
So I click on this little eyedropper and I see, you see that little purple edge there, right? So sometimes when you have a, a light area like the sky against a dark area and you do these heavy um, adjustments, you'll get a color fringe like this, right? So just by clicking it, right? See how it applied three and now the purple color is gone. Okay. I'm just going to show you what happens if I turn these corrections off. Okay. You can see there's that sort of like weird outline there. And it makes your image sharper, believe it or not. Okay, Because color chromatic aberration is your colors of your image are not lining up equally. So it's not as sharp as it could be. Aw, thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Very nice of you to say. Stephanie is enjoying the live events. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're learning so much. That's exactly what I would like to hear happening. Perfect. Uh, and as Rob has mentioned, I have in my schedule and my queue, which is in my head and my Evernote, that I'm going to be making um, separate tutorials just on using a radio filters and just on using graduated filters in Lightroom. Right. So that's where I went with this image. Now, the other thing I could do is um, if I wanted to remove some noise or if I wanted to get, you know, really crazy and remove this wire, right, I would probably take this into Photoshop to do that um, because Lightroom is not the best at removing things like this. OK, and it tends to um, do well on simplistic removal of things like um, a cigarette butt or something small. But um, for removing something large like that, I would take it into Photoshop, right? So I've done one on, on a different horse one. And honestly, I wouldn't worry about this one all that much. Um, we could do something quite simple. Uh, let me zoom in here to 50%. And I use this quite often, this little trick as well, where I will use the healing and clone tool. Okay, so my keyboard shortcut is Q that is designed, I'm just gonna turn off my little green thing here so you can actually see my size of my cursor. Okay, where's my, all right, so see, I wanna get a little brush that is bigger, just bigger than the fence, right? And what I wanna do is I wanna heal, okay? But I'm just gonna do a section of it and Lightroom will choose where it wants to pull from. Now it actually did a pretty good job, but I'm just gonna do it at, say, let's try 50%, okay? Then I'm gonna do the next section. So the idea is that I'm sort of getting rid of it, but I'm just toning it down, okay? So I'm not removing it completely because I know that Lightroom isn't the best at doing that. But let's just see if I can actually just work it a little bit to get it minimized, okay? So I wanna line up the edge of the horse when I do that. Okay, let's try like a bigger all the way across here. And these kinds of things are not a quick fix, okay? You'll notice that in order to get my brushes to overlap, I kind of have to do the paintbrush and then move it over because I can't start painting on the same place. So I got to do that. I'm just going to go right to the edge of the horse. Okay, move it over again. You see how it doesn't overlap unless I move it. So it's just kind of a process of do a little bit, paint some more, do a little bit, right? Now this one, I'm going to change the source. Editing is not, um, it's not a mare, it's not a race, right? It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. That's what the word I'm looking for. The analogy there is it's not a sprint. Okay. So you want to do a little by little to slowly get rid of the things you want to edit out, right? So I'm just gonna go up to there and just show you what that's doing if I turn that off and on. So it's not removing the fence entirely, but you can see that it is just toning it down, okay? So it's not quite so bright. Uh, let me just try and do a big sweep here. Let's see how good we do in one sweep. Right. And you'll notice that it's painting at 50% because that's where I started at. That was the first one that I did. And it tends to remember. Okay, So Lightroom will do the same thing that you did on the last uh, brush stroke. Okay. And let's do one more over here and then we should be good. Okay, I'm going to get out of the tree. Okay, so now you can see that the fence is, is much toned down. And if I wanted to remove it, I could keep um, I could keep going uh, further or take it into Photoshop. 
Didn't realize you could correct that much with Lightroom, Kelly says. Um, lens corrections. Yeah, there's quite a bit of lens corrections that you can do. And most of them, um, I'm still in the lens correction panel here. Most of them are pretty uh, automatic, right? So in this case, it recognized that the lens that she was using was a Sigma um, and which lens was used. And then it does things like it removes um, distortion and edge vignetting, okay? So that naturally occurs with most lenses, but you can also do a little bit more if you want to affect the distortion more, okay? So you can see what that's doing, right? That's lens distortion. And you can see that it's also affecting the vignette, okay? So in some cases, you might actually wanna leave it, okay? So I might decide, okay, I wanna leave the vignette because I like the edges darker and I'm gonna add that anyways, okay? Yeah, the lens panel, the lens correction panel, this is actually something that I use as a preset. So in my uh, presets that I've created, Rob, if you could please share this with the, the group, um, a link to our Lightroom presets. So I have a set of basic settings for import, okay? I don't know if you can see this or not, okay? but basically what this says here is lens correction applied, uh, lens corrections plus clarity, lens corrections plus vignette. So let me just show you what happens when I choose one of these presets on a different image that I haven't done any editing yet, okay? Um, I'm just gonna take this buffalo here and I'm just gonna increase his exposure a little bit just so that you can see him better, okay? And now I'm just gonna apply one of these presets, okay? So the ones that I have here is clarity plus vignette plus sharpen plus contrast, okay? So just clicking that um, gives me those lens corrections applied automatically. And I go down here, I can see that, okay? And it's indeed found the lens, okay? Same idea. But when you are importing into Lightroom, you can actually have that apply on import, okay? So for example, if I wanted to, um, I'm just gonna choose one of these same images again. Uh, like, let's say, okay, so all images. So if I, I'm just giving an example here so you can see. So see how it says apply upon import, develop settings. Okay, so that's where I find my set of basic settings and I can apply any of these to the entire set of images as I import them. So you can actually have it automatically apply lens corrections for you each time you import. You don't have to go and do that yourself. So yes, those are a great thing to do. Um, and if you have a set of our presets, it will do that for you automatically, assuming that Lightroom recognizes your camera and your lens, right? If it doesn't, then we have another fix. All right, so are we happy? I think we're happy with the horse image and I'm gonna move on to the next one. And then there are questions about the horse. All right, there's our link to our Lightroom presets. Okay, so if you wanna check those out, um, there's several others as well, including some vignettes, noise reduction, and they're all about basic edits, okay? So check the Lightroom presets out. All right, let's go to the next one. I think there's actually an article on our website as well, Rob, on using Lightroom presets that, um, that might help Kelly as well. Um, all right, so I'm guessing Nancy is here. I'm just gonna go and assume that, what, did she reply and say that that was Nancy, uh, the Facebook person? Yes, I'm here, okay. So I'm gonna do Nancy's image and Trisha's image. So Nancy had said that the images are darker than what she was expecting when she was, when the image was taken. So I'm not sure if that means they look dark on your computer, Nancy. Um, if you're here, please let me know. Uh, but this one does look a little bit underexposed. So when I go and look at it, what I'm looking at here is the histogram. Okay, so again, it's representative of tones. So this tells me there's lots of dark tones, there's lots of sort of shadowy tones, and then not much else, okay? so. If I want to do what's called set the white point in the black point, I can simply do shift, double click on whites, double click on blacks. Okay, so now see how that stretched out the histogram to touch the right side, which means if I hold down the Alt Option key, that it's just sort of clipping that sun area. 
I'm gonna come back a little bit so I don't have any whites clipping. Okay, so that's the actual exposure that that it should be as an average exposure, okay? Now I know that I don't want it to be that bright because it's a sunset, so we're gonna lower that a little bit. And then I'm gonna bring the highlights down, okay? It also looks really, really pink, like really overly saturated. And again, she's used a camera vivid profile, which does tend to increase saturation. So I'm gonna look at some of the others here because in increasing the contrast, I'm gonna go actually with scenery. Because when I increase the contrast, right, you'll notice that if I change this black here and this white here, it increases the saturation as well. Okay, so when you increase the, the especially blacks, you're gonna get more color saturation. Okay, so don't touch these saturation of vibrant sliders until you've done your contrast. I also find it's a little bit on the cool side. It's very magenta pink. And I'm thinking that the sun should be a little bit more orange. So I wanna go a little more this way and maybe even a little more this way. Okay, so that feels more like a sunset to me as opposed to the vibrant neon pink, right? The other thing that I notice here, and I don't know if you can see these, is there are some, I'm just gonna darken the sky here, water spots, okay? Can you see that dark circles here? Okay, so that means that those are either water spots on your lens. Uh, let me see what she shot this at. My guess is something on the lens, okay? Because this was shot at F22, anything you have on the front of your lens could come into sharp focus, okay? So these could be um, spots on the sensor, but more likely it's a dirty lens. So check the front of your lens if you're getting spots like this, especially if you're shooting at a closed small aperture like F22, okay? Now I'm gonna get rid of these spots using the cloning and healing tool. I'm gonna make sure that I'm at 100% this time. And there's a neat little trick with this tool. If you open your toolbar, okay, that's T, <coughs> excuse me, T on your keyboard, and then click this little thing here that says visualize spots, okay? And what you can do is turn this up a little bit. So literally it's showing me where the spots are, okay? So I'm just gonna click where the spots. I think there's some here, some here. Okay. Now these ones here, I'm not sure if that's a bird. Okay. Now there is a spot. I'm actually gonna remove these ones because sometimes a bird that's really out of focus, okay, just looks like a, a dot um, that's dirt. So I'm not going to leave that. And that's your creative license, okay? So now it looks like I've got most of the spots, okay? There's another one here sort of in the, in the, um, uh, right on the horizon. So let's see if I can get rid of those two. There we go. Okay, make sure you get them all. Now, if you have a lot of images that you've taken, you can then copy and paste that. Okay, so for example, I can just do Command or Control C and I can just copy the spot removal, so nothing else. Okay, and this is another image that she shot. Actually, let's do the whole thing. Let's copy everything because I punched up the... Um, color and everything. So let's see if we can get this one to match. It looks like the same scene. So then I'm just gonna do command or control V. And you'll notice that the spot removal got applied in the same place, right? So if I turn off the spot removal, I can see if it's made any boo-boos, right? And just delete any that I don't want, right? But it's a great way to start and get close, right? So I'm probably just going to remove a couple of them Where'd my spots go? Oops, got to turn them on. There we go. So I don't like that one. Let's turn that one off and let's turn that one off. But the rest, this one doesn't look like it's matching so good. So I'll just delete that one. That one looks good. Okay, the rest, you just want to make sure that when you have something like this that has lines, that they, they actually line up, okay? So you can see that really quickly, just a copy and paste, okay, we went there. Okay, so what else would I do? So she's asking about, you know, is this image too dark? I would say that it's not necessarily too dark, that this is just an image that has a lot of contrast, right? Okay? 
So what I want to do here next is just crop it a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to crop because what I'm looking at is two things. Number one, the horizon is right in the middle. If you look at that rule of thirds and the grid there. Okay, so I want to get the horizon off the center. And I like the sun placement kind of off to the side. But what, what I'm talking about or looking at is something called visual mass. Okay, when I look at this image, there's a big, heavy, dark thing on the left. And there's nothing except like one swan or bird on the right. So the, the thing on the left feels like the image wants to tip over because it feels heavy. Right? Dark things feel heavier. So I'm going to actually keep the aspect ratio, but I'm going to crop in fairly significantly, maybe about there. Okay, so the sun is still off center, but now I'm getting less sky and keeping that reflection because I love that reflection in the water. And let's make sure that our horizon is straight as well. So that's the crop tool and auto. Okay, I could also use this ruler here just to make sure and stretch it along the horizon. And yep, it is straight. Okay. Oh, I think I missed the spot. See, now I'm seeing more spots down in here. So you have to be be really conscious of looking for these dust spots. Once you see them, okay, they're quite subtle, right? Well, let's see. Now I could increase the the shadows, right? If I want detail on that island or that piece of land, but I really don't need that. It's a sunset. And I'm going to play again with the color balance a little bit. Actually, that's looking kind of nice. Let's do a little bit less pink. It seems very pink, and I'm not sure why. Maybe it was just an interesting sunset. All right. But I wouldn't be too worried, if Nancy, if you're watching this, about it being too dark. Um, this is just a situation where it's really, really contrasty and hard to expose because your camera's going to get fooled. And when you're doing a sunset, you actually want to... Um, underexpose it. So if you could please share the article on shooting sunsets, please, Rob, there's three tips for shooting sunsets to make them more interesting. And let's see what Kelly said. So visualize spots. Yep, that's a new one. <laughs> awesome. So there's lots of, of little things that you might learn if you have the toolbar open, right? So for example, uh, let me go back to this image here. If I want to, um, oops, if I want to open up, um, if I want to open up the graduated filter, for example. Okay, so let's just say I'm making a graduated filter. Okay, so here it allows me to just turn the overlay off and on. So it's not so such a big deal, okay, because I know that I can do that with a keyboard shortcut of O. Okay, so I don't use the the tools um, tips for everything, right? But if I'm using the crop tool, see, this is where you're going to show the overlay, right, um, or have it hide. Right? When you're not using a particular tool, you'll see some other things here as well, right? Like before and after. And I use the backslash key to do the before and afters, right? So I don't use the toolbar a lot, but it is there and it does have sort of extra little things for each tool, right? All right, so let's move on to Trisha's. So let's see, what have we already learned so far? You've learned um lens corrections and visualize spots awesome some great tips so far now this is an image of trish's and i think she's here so this one is one that um she said that the image that i did last week which had a rock face reminded her of one that she shot that looks like a face and it kind of does i'm assuming she means like this part over here kind of looks like a like a face sticking out, or maybe she means this one with a nose, right? But the uh, original unedited image is the same challenge as we just dealt with with the sunset, okay? It's a highly contrast situation. So all of these images we've looked at so far have a darker subject and a brighter background, okay? And in the case of a sunset, that's what you want. In a case of a landscape or the horse like this, you end up with a situation where you have to make a decision between exposing for the background or exposing for the subject, okay? When you have a scene like this, ideally, uh, okay, she says the shape on the right. I assume so. Kind of looks like a like a gorilla face almost. Okay, so if you have a situation like this, ideally, if you could shoot bracketed images, that would work out well. But what I did here was some of the same kind of techniques that I used on the horse. Okay, so I used 
I use the graduated filter, right? Um, pulled down, pulled up from the top, okay, or pulled up from the bottom. And I did the same sort of luminance mask again. So it's only applying to the land mostly, okay? And it, I've done a plus exposure, plus contrast, plus whites, and plus texture. So I'm trying to pick up all of those things in the rock face. And then the other one that I pulled down from the top, okay, I've done minus exposure and plus dehaze and minus highlights, okay? So I wanted to bring those highlights down in the water, but dehaze does a really nice job of sort of picking up contrast, like watch what happens when I do that, okay? So see, you notice how, remember I said when you increase your blacks, you get more color? So look at how when there's no dehaze, the water almost looks gray, but then when I crank it up, it increases the blacks and literally that's what dehaze is doing, okay? Because I was doing this before there was a dehaze slider, okay? And it's affecting the water for the most part because I did that mask again, okay? So I did a mask based on luminance, okay? And I could see that there's a few areas that I missed. So I actually uh, brushed some of the areas out, okay? So along with a mask or um, an, an automatic mask like this luminance one, you can even paint it in, okay? So now I can choose the brush. So I'm still in the graduated filter, but now I'm going to brush using erase and check off this auto mask box, okay? I'm actually gonna uncheck it for this thing because I wanna get all these parts here that show red on the rocks. I just want to get rid of all any of this thing that's applying on the rocks. And I could see that I just missed a few areas because some of the tones in the rocks are similar to the water. And I didn't want to go any more with the slider because it was applying less to the water and making it look weird. So I'll show you, I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, let me turn off the overlay. So when I go further, you'll see that the water starts to, it starts to not apply to the dark areas of the water, right? So I wanted to keep it like that and I just masked it off a bit more manually, right? So using this brush part of the tool, right? So using those two graduated filters, I was able to brighten the rocks and darken and bring out color in the water, right? So the challenge with this one also is when I zoom in, right, the rocks are not the sharpest thing, okay? You can see that the water is actually sharper than the rocks. I think the focus was here. And let's see, so shot at F9 at 220th of a second, okay? So you might have wanted either to focus, make sure your focus is right here if the rock is your subject, okay? And in this case, if you had used a larger aperture like f4 or 5.6 in this case, whatever your lens maximum has at that focal length range, use a, a wider aperture, make sure you focus on the rock, then the water would be a bit more out of focus <clears throat> because what happens when you're dealing with a subject that looks like this is often you're dealing with framing, right? So the outline of the rock is framing something else and it causes the viewer to look into the middle, okay? So the viewer is looking into this gap here in the middle and there's nothing there to catch our attention, right? So we can actually go the opposite way with the water, right? Because I've punched up the contrast. Well, let's just say I want to take it down the other way, okay? So let's say I wanna darken it, but I don't want attention on that. So I'm gonna lower the texture, lower the clarity, and bring it right down so it's almost soft looking, okay? So now, right, I've talked about this before, but there are four things that grab your attention, okay? So the, these are the things that grab your attention in an image, brightness, sharpness, color, and contrast. So when your subject has those things, great, bonus, then your eye's gonna go directly ahead, right? If your subject is not having those things, for example, in this image here, right? So if you have brightness, contrast, sharpness, and color in the background, right? Um, then your eye's gonna be drawn to the background, right? If you could please share um, a link to making your background better, please, Rob. And I've turned off my picture because someone is saying my audio is not syncing with me, um, I think. No, my maybe not. Did you say my audio was not syncing correctly? 
I should be pretty close. Okay, so please share a link to the one on the backgrounds, improving your backgrounds. So I hope that helps, Trish. Um, I actually kind of like the water uh, the way it was before. Like I like to have it a bit more punchy, right? So I like it contrasty like this. All right, so there we go. So that's what I would do to that one, okay? And it does kind of look like a gorilla face. I see that totally. Any questions for that one, Trish? Um, Stephanie's saying it syncs on Facebook and not synced on YouTube. Okay, that's possible, yeah, because it's a different streaming service. So um, listen to me. Don't watch my lips move. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Glad that helps, helps Trish. Okay. So the next one I wanted to show you is this chicken. Um, this is actually another image of, of Regan's. And uh, as I mentioned, she's got lots of critters on her, her farm. They've got ducks and chickens and dogs and cats and horses. And um, <laughs> I'm en actually envious. Um, so what I did with this one is I'm going to show you the unedited version here. I'm just going to make a copy of it. So I cropped it quite a bit. So this was one that she shot in her little makeshift studio in her home with, with studio lights and everything and a background. And I wanted to bring out the texture in the chicken. Okay, I want to zoom in even further. So I wanted to bring out the texture and the feathers. Okay, but can you see what's happening here in the background? There was there was this weird kind of modeled look in the background. If I if I increase the clarity and the texture, okay, you see what happens is I've picked up the texture and the feathers, but look at that background, okay? So it's doing something really weird, right? So I wanted to do affect the chicken, but not the background, okay? So all of the stuff that I just demonstrated on Trish's where I, and the horse, where I use those um, tools, and look at how nice and bright blue and smooth the background is, right? And the chicken is sharp, okay? So I did the same thing again. I changed the camera profile. Um, I could actually even pick a different one, right? If I don't want so much, so much vibrance, but I like the landscape because it gave a bit more punch, right? Um, I increased the whites just until I get some clipping. So I'm using that Alt Option key, dragging up whites till I see clipping, and you'll see black areas. Um, the part that's white is clipping, okay? So I'm holding it down until I get rid of the clipped areas. Then I'm doing the same on the black slider, but in this case with blacks, you actually want to clip a little bit, okay? So I wanna make sure I have some blacks because that will give me those deeper, richer colors, okay? Now I didn't do clarity and texture here for the reason that I just mentioned about it affecting the background, okay? So I went and I used a radial filter on the chicken Okay, so you can see that I've applied it just to the chicken and I used a color range mask and I literally just clicked on the feathers until I got it covering the part of the chicken that I wanted. So you would think that white is not a color, but it does, right? So you can see that as I click around here, okay, now it picked up something in the background. Here, let me just shift that there. Can you see now there's a little bit of green glow in the background here? Okay, so I want to get this close to where I had it, okay? So I don't want to glow. There we go. Okay, so that looks like a better mask on the chicken, right? If I zoom in, okay? So, and what I've applied here is that plus texture and plus clarity. I also increased the exposure a little bit and brought the highlights down, okay? So I make sure that I'm not clipping those highlights by checking the J key, right? So there's nothing clipping, right? There's clipping shows in red, just bring it down till there's no clipping, right? So I'm using that radio filter. Then what I did was I used a graduated filter and here's another little trick, okay? So if you want something to apply to the entire image, okay, shrink it down, okay? So what I did was I just zoomed out to 25%, okay? So it makes the image smaller so I have space around it. And then I just dragged a graduated filter all the way across the whole image, okay? Then I used that color mask, the color range again, to make sure that it was only applying on the chicken. 
Okay, I'm just going to go into about 66% because I saw there was a little bit of blurring. So what I'm doing now is I've done minus sharpness, increased noise reduction, right? And yeah, I could even bring down texture and clarity because what's happening is I wanted to get rid of all that model business in the background. Okay, so I want to make sure it's not on the bird. So let's just see, because I saw a little bit of blur applying on the bird. Okay, so if I go that way, I get less of it. If I go that way, you're going to start to see the bird is, is looking blurry as well. Okay, so I want to have nice clean edges on the bird. That looks pretty good. If I get a little bit of outline of the blue showing, that's fine, I think, because it's going to pick up the texture of the feathers over the background. And I'm happy with that. Okay, so now when I zoom in to 100%, what I'm looking for is the background is nicely blurred, but the edges of the feathers are sharp. And I was able to do that with that color mask because it picks up the blue so nicely, All right? And if I look at this again, what it's doing, right, you can see if I turn it off, I zoom in even more, right? You can see, oops, I've applied an HSL thing. I'm just gonna turn that off so you can see that as well. You can see that modeledness again is there, right? So simply by affecting, where's my, where's my mask? Simply by affecting these, where's my radio filter? There it is. Okay, so simply by affecting the sharpness and the texture of the blues in this image, okay, I've, I've, I've applied all these things to the background, right? I could also darken it or brighten it. Okay, you can see how it's affecting that now. Um, I could also even shift the color, okay? So if I wanted to completely change the color of the background, I actually could do that here, okay? It's pretty cool. Okay, so the other thing I did was I applied some HSL adjustments, right? I shifted the blue a little bit. I gave it a little bit more saturation and I could darken it as well. Okay, I'm gonna use this tool. I could darken it or I could lighten it. So now you can see there's actually blue in the in the feathers, right? Now that I, I can zoom in here, let me get in here. So you can see how the blue is actually in, in the feathers as well. So you have to be careful when you're using this HSL panel, so it stands for hue, saturation, and luminance, that anything that has that tint is going to be affected, okay? So if I want to brighten, I could actually brighten those feathers too, okay? Uh, I could also say, okay, I want more saturation in the yellow, so I can increase his, his beak. Maybe I want to darken that yellow a little bit, or brighten it. And if I want to affect that stool, I could work on that as well. Maybe I want to shift it more orange or brown. There we go. Brown's kind of nice. So we're really playing with these colors of this image using the HSL panel. Okay. So instead of red, now the, the stool is brown. So before, Okay, so it was a great image to start with, really nice lighting on the chicken, nice texture on the feathers, okay, and we solved that problem of the texture in the background that the, the camera, for some reason, was picking up, okay. <laughs> so Rob says he was seeing spots, um, but of course, he, he had uh, not cleaned his monitor. So make sure that the spots that you're seeing are actually not on the image, but on your screen itself, <laughs> okay? All right. Oh yes, good point, her beak. Yes, it's a chicken, it's a chicken, not a rooster. So yes, her beak, my, my, my pardons. All right. So any of the links that uh, Rob is sharing in the chat will be in the YouTube chat. Um, they don't get shared necessarily everywhere that we are streaming because Rob is sharing them. Um, so if you want to grab those links, if you're not seeing the chat, just head over to the video on YouTube. It's on our channel. Uh, if you could share a link to our channel, Rob, um, uh, actually I can put that on the screen, believe it or not. There you go. So just go to youtube.com forward slash digital photo mentor and you'll see all of our lives there and they will have all the reference links 
for this one that we mentioned, okay? So it's streaming there live right now. And when the video, when we're done live, um, it will still be there and we'll have all the links in the description. Just give us a little bit of time to update it, but it will be in the chat for you as well. Okay, good point. All right, how are we doing? So far we've had chicken and a horse. Uh, let's see what else we can work on. So we've got this buffalo that was sent in by Kelly. Oh, Kelly, <laughs> we have your buffalo or your bison. So let's do this one. And this is actually her version, okay, which, is, which looks pretty good. So you've picked up a lot of detail in his fur and you, I see that you've chosen to, to crop off the back end because he was really tight to the edge of the frame and I, I see that. So what I might choose to do if I wanted to spend a lot of time editing this, um, let's see how we go today, is to actually try and extend the background. So that might be an, a neat little trick because I'd like to see his feet um, and I agree that I want more space in front of him like you have here. And let's see, yes, you cropped up from the top as well. So this one for me, I might actually go a little bit more panoramic. Okay, so I might just crop a little bit from the bottom. And I like the space in front of him, but I wanna get rid of that one bird on the right and keep just one bird. So I like that cropping. And let's go back to the start. So again, I'm gonna go with camera profile. Let's see if any of these are better. So landscape gives me more color. Okay, portrait, more red. I definitely like the landscape one. So we're gonna start with that. And then I'm gonna see about white balance. So this is a raw file from a Canon camera, so CR2. Um, we could try auto white balance. So you could see that it definitely warmed it up a little bit. I'm gonna try daylight even, okay? And I find that daylight does a pretty good job, but often there's too much magenta. So I'll usually dial that down a little bit. And to be honest, I don't mind that because the prairies should be, you know, this is, we're good Alberta girls, right? So this, um, is something that you wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't see this in Australia, right, Linton? Um, you don't see the buffalo roaming the prairies, and unfortunately, we don't have them here wild anymore, um, but there's a lot of bison farms, right? So this is a very typical prairie scene, and I think this color is probably closer to what we would see. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and then I'm going to get into doing a little bit of texture, and I'm gonna do the same as I did on the horse. So I'm gonna do a radial filter, stretch it over the bison, okay? And you can see where it's applying. Let's widen that a little bit. So it doesn't have to be perfect, right? I know that it's darkening, but I'm just gonna reset it, double click the word effect. So I wanna actually give him a bit more exposure and I'm gonna add white, right? So watch what happens when I add white. See how the contrast on his fur is picking up? So if I just do shadows, I'll show you the difference. Okay, if I just do shadows, um, I pick up lots of detail in him, but then he starts to look flat, okay? So I wanna keep the shadows. Let's go part way with that one, and let's go a little more with exposure, okay? So he seems to have more depth of dimension this way, when you have, when you keep the whites and the blacks, okay? So I'm gonna punch that up. I wanna give them more texture and a little bit of clarity. Okay, so look at the difference that this radio filter is doing. Okay, now of course it's affecting part of the background as well. So I'm gonna go luminance and let's just see where it's applying. Okay, I'm actually gonna make it a little bigger or just not feather it so much, okay? And I want it to apply to the dark areas this time. So I'm gonna mask from the right, get rid of the light areas. Now see, it's mostly just on the buffalo now, okay? I prefer calling him a buffalo. So now it's really just applying to him, okay? Turn it off, turn it on. And maybe just change that a little bit. I'm really playing with these sliders. I want, I want it to appear smoother because you don't want to end up with some weird stuff like that, okay? So if you mess with your sliders, see it's affecting a bit of the background, right? So I don't want that happening, right? So I can either, you know, play with this a little bit more and get rid of even more, go farther, right? But then I start to lose some of his fur, which I don't want to do. So I want to keep all of him. 
And let's just smooth it out a little bit. Okay, so it's more of a softer gradation. So it looks more natural, okay? That looks good to me. All right, now I could do the same and darken the background, but I'm not gonna do that because if I wanna extend the background, I wanna sort of keep it non-vignetted for now, okay? We can go in and play with the HSL panel, okay? So this is a cool one because I can do luminance and I could target the greens, for example, right? So see how just by clicking and dragging up or down, I can affect the brightness of the background, okay? I actually don't mind it brighter. Let's just see about saturation. Let's uh, desaturate these yellows just a tiny bit. And let's see if green, no, there's not much green. Often in grass, you'll see that there's some green and some yellow, okay? This one tends to be more yellow. So I do like lightening it. And let's see, we lowered the saturation a little bit. And we could also affect the hue again. So I could make it more orange or more green. That's not bad. And let's see about this guy. He's going to be a bit more orange too. Okay. So before, after, and you'll notice that I haven't really, I've pushed the exposure up about 0.95 here to increase the exposure, but I'm going to play around with the whites a little bit more. So it's this dance, right? So I do one adjustment and then I'm going to come back and do another, right? So I definitely want to clip some, but not too far. Just like so. So I'm keeping lots of contrast in the bison. And let's just compare. Right? So you've done a great job of bringing him out here, Kelly. I would say just go a little farther. Right? He could have a little more texture. Right? You could add a little bit more um, exposure on him using that radio filter. Right? And darken the background. He looks also pink to me. This whole thing looks a little bit pink. Right? So if you shift a bit more green and yellow, right, he's going to look more brown. Right? That's what I see as the main difference is this is a lot warmer. Right? Does anybody want me want to see me try and extend this background? Okay, So this is something that I would do in Photoshop. Is anybody interested to see me attempt this? I have no idea if it's going to go well, if I'll be able to do this or not. Um, but if you want to see me do that, let me know. So Nancy was asking, or maybe this was Trish, what is causing the blue to bleed on the chicken? Um, it's because there's just some naturally, there's blue in the shadows, right? So there's blue in the shadow areas of most things. And also because it's a blue background, it was reflecting into the feathers as well. So you naturally will get some of the background color on your subject. Yep. All right. Let's see, very smoky. So it was very smoky when you pho photographed it, had a hard time editing. Um, I'm assuming that was happened this summer because we've been dealing with the wildfires. So, uh, okay, so we want some, people want to see me attempt to do the background. All right, let's give this a go. So if you have Photoshop, if you have the photographer's um, uh, version of um, Adobe, so the photographer's package, right, you can right click and no, I don't want to edit and I don't want to export. Right click and open it as a smart object, okay? So what that will do is it's going to open Photoshop and it's going to open this image as a layer, as a smart object, okay? So smart objects means that anything I do to this image, such as adding a filter or so on, um, it's editable. So if I bring this into Luminar, for example, um, I can edit it and go back to Luminar and change the settings without losing anything. Okay, so I will do that as a smart object. All right, so there's my image, um, or, Ke or Kelly's image, rather, in Photoshop. So if I want to extend the background, okay, what I need to do is increase the canvas size, right? So if I just change the image size, right? So if I go image, resize, okay, all it will do is either stretch the whole image and make everything bigger and try to make more pixels, okay, which is not what I want. Okay, So in this case, what I want to do is change the canvas size. Okay, So I'm going to go edit. Uh, I actually don't know where this is <laughs> because I usually do the short shortcut. Okay, so there it is. Okay, so it's canvas size. 
I usually do keyboard shortcuts and I'm going to do pixels. Okay, so you can say, okay, I want to increase the size of this canvas. Okay, so it's currently 6422 pixels wide. Uh, I'm just going to make a guess. Um, I can always crop it again later. So I'm going to say I'm going to make it 6800 pixels wide instead. Okay, now if I leave this dot in the center, what it's going to do is it's going to add background on both sides, but I don't want that. I want it only on the left. Okay, so I'm going to say put the image on the right and everything over here. If I need to make more, it's going to show up as blank. Okay, uh, now it's doing a canvas extension other. Let's see what I've got. I'm not sure why. Okay, so now I've got a blank bit of canvas. Okay. There are a few things that I can try here, right? So what I'm going to do is the first thing I'm going to do is grab this rectangular marquee tool, okay? So I'm just going to grab a section of this image that is about the same width, okay? So I'm just going to do, does that look about the same width? I want to make sure I get wide enough, okay? So I've got the section of that, and I'm just going to do duplicate. Okay, so what that does is it creates that selection that I just did on a new layer. Okay, now I'm going to use the move tool. Right, so this is the new layer. I'm moving it over here. Okay, so literally I can just butt it up to the other one. Okay, I could also put it underneath. Okay, to so see if it blends a little bit better. Okay. Um, and then what I can do is start to do what's called like the content aware fill. So it looks like it blends okay, but not great because the colors are a little bit different, right? So I could try and match the colors a little better or I could, I could choose a selection from a different area. Um, if I go down here, like it matches better with the dirt, right? But it doesn't match up here. So I could play around with another selection. Uh, let's try another selection here. Oops, where's my... So I'm going to select this area and duplicate. Oops. Got to be on the buffalo layer. There we go. So now I duplicate it again. And then I'm going to move this one over. Okay, so see how it didn't... I didn't go wide enough. So I'm just going to undo that. My selection was not big enough. Okay, so I'll make a new selection. Let's do make sure I've got my selection tool. Okay, so I need to make sure it's wide enough. That looks better. I'm on the buffalo. Copy it. Move it. Okay, so now, see that matches a little bit better. Okay, so then I'm going to do things like I can actually go back to this other layer. Let me put my layers over here so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so this is the layer that's got, let's put that one up here. So the first one is that square I created there, right? And now this is the new one I just created over top, okay? So I could blend those together a little bit better. And what I'm going to try and do is make another blank layer. And then I'm going to use these, the healing patch. Okay, so the healing patch operates in a content aware fashion. Okay, so I'm just going to draw around here and it should sample all layers. I've got that checked off and that's my target. And then I just drag it over here and drop it. So it's going to try and match these two. Okay, now look what happened. Looks pretty good, right? I'm just going to do it again. Okay. Don't want his butt. And I might have to do this a few times. Um, see, I'm still not getting rid of the line, right? So I could do this again down here. Just want it to blend a little better. Right, this is looking pretty good. I still want this area to be a little darker. So let's do that. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit more so I can see what I'm doing here. I wasn't happy with that last one. Let's do that one again. Try that. So it's a process of trial and error, right? So I really wasn't happy with, with what I got here. So I'm just going to do another selection because I still got that edge right there. So I want to make sure that the edge blends. Okay, That's a little better. We're getting closer. 
right? And then we've got in here. So see how I'm lining up or trying to line things up? That's pretty close. Okay, now the foot part's gonna be tricky. I might might have to do this one manually. Yeah, so his, his foot went a little wonky there, but I'll fix that in a minute. So I'm just doing it piece by piece. So it's like a test on my Photoshop skills here. Okay, so let's see how his tail goes. It's not bad. Okay, so we're getting close. And it looks like we've got you know, pretty good matching going on. Looks like it blends. There's a couple of places where I'd probably do a little bit better, right? But overall, it looks like it's blending pretty well. Um, this foot, I'm not super happy with. So I'm going to use the stamp tool, right? So clone and stamp. And I'm going to use it in lighten mode at 80%. And actually, I'm going to go 50%. Make sure that the brush is soft. And I'm just going to select. So I want to just sort of soften this edge a little bit. Okay, so that looks like a better ankle of a moose, right? Moose, pardon me. Another prairie animal. Right? Now this edge of his foot here kind of looks funny as well. And it looks like his foot is missing part of his foot. So I might go in and um, just try and fix this part of his foot here because it looks like he's missing part of his leg. No, well, that's not going to work. Trial and error. Eh. Like I said, trial and error. So I'm going to lighten. Let's just go in and paint that. And I'm going to go like so. So this is just going to soften this edge a little bit here. All right. How do we do? Corner over here is not perfect yet, but I could probably use the stamp tool in darken mode. And let's go about 50%, bigger brush. Right. So I'm just kind of, let's just clone this grass into the corner. There we go. All right, so how do we do? So if I go back to, there's the original. And built in the layers and then blended it. Okay, like I said, it's not perfect. I would probably work it a little bit more, but it looks pretty good. All right. <laughs> Rob says better than you could do. Um, David says, I thought the content aware fill would fill in without a copy. You still have to, um, you have to select, you have to make a selection and then say fill. So another way that I could have gone about it, that's just how I attacked this one. Uh, another way I could have gone about it was to create another blank layer and then tell it to fill that in to match the other one. But I felt like it would do um, a better job if I did it piece by piece. So it is using content aware fill, but within a different tool than just content aware fill. Awesome. So what did you think? So you can see now that I'm back here, this, this part here isn't perfect, right? So I could probably just do a better job of cleaning up this. And the nice thing is because I did this as a Photoshop document, I can just right click this anytime and go edit in Photoshop, make sure I choose edit original. So it'll open up the layered file and it'll pop right back into where I left off, right? So if I want to continue working on that, I can just open it up in Photoshop. But I'm just gonna see what it does here in terms of healing. Let's just see what happens if I attempt to use the heal and clone tool in Lightroom. See, now I'm getting a duplicate, so it matches exactly, which is kind of what you want to avoid. Right? You, you don't want to have a duplicate area, right, side by side, so it looks exactly the same. That's the giveaway that you've done an edit, right? So when you do an edit and everything is matchy-matchy, you've got two things side by side that look exactly the same. Um, it's a repeating pattern. It's a clue that you've done a edit, right? So there's Kelly's version. And there's my finished version. 
right? So there's your homework, Kelly. <laughs> okay. So if you have Photoshop, um, give that a go. It's just, it's a process, like I said, of trial and error, and you have to learn about the tools and making selections. And of course, you know, I'm quicker at it because I know what the tools are and I know which tools I want and I use the keyboard shortcuts and so on, right? But if you're not really familiar with Photoshop, just take your time. Um, we actually did a couple of master classes with Pete Vandenine and um, we may have those available for uh, purchase because they were recorded. We may have those available shortly. And he does a lot of teaching where he does Photoshop for Lightroom users particularly, okay? So people that primarily use Lightroom, um, how to do some things that you might wanna know how to do in Photoshop, right? All right, so you're gonna take that challenge on Kelly. She says she's gonna give it a try, all right. I challenge you the gloves the glove has been the gauntlet has been thrown um i think we're going to keep our session to an hour and a half today just because it's uh, a bit warm here and i don't want to have to take a break and turn my air conditioner on so i think one or two more images and we'll continue with the critters right so we've got a theme going on today of of critters now this one was submitted from Linton's Camera Group last week um, by Kathy. So if um, if you are talking to her, Linton, let her know that I'm going to take this one a bit farther. So that's the original image. And that's where we're at so far. Okay, so I basically I've done a crop, right? So I cropped out a lot of the image because the original um has a lot of foreground right so i felt like the sea lions were really far away so we cropped to bring them closer and i just did a quick vignette on that okay so taking it a little bit farther um i might want to do some uh, additional adjustments okay so i've done all the things i've talked about before so i increased the whites increased the blacks okay now I could do a radio filter on them. Okay, so it looks like I did. Yeah, so I did a radio filter on them and I added texture and clarity, okay? But I could also add a little bit more black. I could add a little bit more white. I could even warm them up, okay? So see how I can affect the color temperature as well. So if I want them to be warmer, but not the water, okay? This is a great way to do it. And let's expand that just a little bit. Uh, let's see, I've got another one, which is darkening the outside, okay? So this one I could choose to, I brought the highlights down and the exposure down. I could go a little farther and I'm gonna make this more circular because I wanna darken that sand, okay? So see how that's affecting that? If you're not sure what your um, mask is doing, take it to an extreme, okay? So I know that I want it to ap apply around them, but not on them, okay? And then just bring your slider back. So go to extreme if you're really not sure what's happening, right? And I could even bring the texture down and the clarity down. So all of those things that we talked about before, those four things that grab your attention, sharpness, okay? So the sea lines or the seals are the sharpest thing in the picture. And I've done two things to enhance that, right? Sharpen them and de-sharpen the background. Um, I've made them a warmer color, so they will stand out. Warm colors uh, project and cool colors recede or go back into the background. Okay. Then I'm going to go and adjust the whole image a little bit. Now, this was a JPEG as shot. So you'll notice that when I go to the white balance, I don't have the choice of all of those presets like daylight, shady, and so on. So if you are shooting... Um, a JPEG, you have to really get the white balance correct, okay? If you if you have shot JPEG and the color balance is wrong, I've demonstrated other ones where you actually end up changing it to black and white. So I could try auto, okay? So it's definitely increased the warmth, you can see that. And I'm probably gonna go just slightly less, okay? So it definitely does need some warmth um, added. So now we've got before and after, okay? Uh, let's see, what else would I do here? I'm gonna duplicate this one and I'm just making what's called a virtual copy and I'm gonna reset it so you can see the original. Now look at this one. So this is the opposite problem that we had with the first few images where they had a lot of contrast. Now we don't have enough contrast, okay? So how can I tell? When I'm looking at the histogram, there's nothing touching the left or black and there's nothing touching the right or white. So everything is squished into the middle of gray, gray tones, okay? So it's a range of gray tones. 
when I go over to the edited one, look at how much more spread out it is. There's still a lot of nib tones in the center, okay? But now you can see that we're touching the side on both edges, okay? And that's what's gonna give you that beautiful contrast and color without playing with saturation and vibrance, okay? Because if I tried to do that here, okay, let's say I wanted to add contrast, okay, so I can add contrast, and then I'm gonna add some saturation. Okay, your colors start to go really funky, okay? Now see, I don't have to add saturation to be able to do that. I could go into HSL, and let's say I want a bit more blue in the water, so we could increase the blue. We could also give the sea lines a bit more saturation, uh, like so. Maybe I want to even lighten the water. There we go. Right, so that's about all I would do with this image. So now it's gone from, you know, a snapshot that was kind of really far away. The cropping really, really helps here. Okay, the reason for that. Um, is that when you have something that is, look at where the horizon is, okay? Or look at where the middle of the picture is, pardon me, right? The sea lions don't appear in the frame. Half the bottom of the frame is all empty, okay? Is there anything in this bottom half of the frame that is important to the story? No. Is there anything over here that is important to the story? No. So if you look at this image where these boxes are, the square up here is pretty much where your image is, right? And I find that, you know, the interesting play between the seagull and the sea lions, that's where your image is, right? Sea lions are looking one way, birds going the other way, typical life on the beach. And the guy in the background is enjoying himself in the sun, right? Or herself. All right, any question? Uh, he said, Linton says, the water around the heads of the sea lines appears too light. Okay, so yes, that's one thing I just noticed when I when I zoomed out and you could sort of see that that vignette is then showing up too much. So I could go back in and it's good to look at your images zoomed in and zoomed out because if I go back to that radio filter, right, I can see that indeed I've probably lightened too much and it's lightening this part of the water, okay? So I could do two things. I could either edit and brush it out, right? Or I could try either a luminance mask and take it off the bright areas, but then I'm losing the fur, okay? See that? So I wanna keep it on the sea lions, but not on the water. So luminance didn't work so well. So let me try color. So when you do a color mask, it gives you the color picker and I'm gonna just put it on the sea lion and let's see. So I've picked up most of them except the inside of his mouth, okay? So that's not too bad, right? So you see as I click around, it's picking up different parts of the sea lion, but it's also picking up the water as well, okay? So I can try the smoothing, okay? And as a final resort, I've got the brush that I can do erase. I'm gonna do auto mask and just keep it off the water, okay? So I'm going around and Lightroom will find the edges for you with the auto mask on, okay? So see how I'm getting that edge of that seaweed over there too. Perfect. And I can decide if I want this guy to be part of the subject or not. I don't think he needs to be enhanced, okay? So I'll turn off the mask, how's that? Better? I think that's better. Maybe it's in the other one. That yeah, could be in this one. Okay, so see how I'm darkening around? So this is the opposite case then. Instead of erasing, I'm going to mask and paint in to the water. Okay, so see how I'm adding that darkening that was on the rest of the water so that I'm losing the halo, okay? And I've painted at a very strong opacity, so I probably should do that at a lower opacity. Okay, so see how that's now getting in on them, right? I'm just gonna take it down a tiny bit. So I wanna make sure that I don't get this nasty halo there, okay? So halos are a major problem and you wanna make sure you don't get them. So thank you for picking that up. 
So I'm just trying to blend it out a little bit so it doesn't look so haloed, right? Like so. How's that better? I think so. You have some shots like this from Kangaroo Island um, with, with sea lions. So Kangaroo Island has sea lions. Awesome. Yeah, dig those out. Send them on over. I'd love to get some of your images, Ron. Perfect. Linton approves. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for picking that up. And I, I agree, Linton. Like once I went back to this view here where I saw the thumbnails, I could see it more clearly that there was a halo, right? So that's why I'm saying take a step back from your edit sometime because if you're looking at them too closely, um, a lot of people do what I would consider pixel peeping where they're looking at stuff super close, like too close, and they don't see the forest for the trees, so to speak. Okay, so this is an image that was submitted by one of my other subscribers, Kay Freeze, and um, it looks like these owls and a little baby owl here. Too bad he's not facing this way. And then he's got another one of um, this guy, right? So I love that he's facing the camera here, but there's a lot of stuff going on and he's pretty small. So unfortunately, this one I would love to crop. and It doesn't give me the metadata, but let's see what we can do. So ARW is a Olympus file, I believe. So I'm going to take this one. I'm going to do one image and then see if we copy and paste to the other, except for cropping. Okay. So what am I going to do first? Camera profile. Okay. So this one has a landscape profile, portrait, vivid, standard. I'm going to go with landscape. See how that punched that up a little bit. And I'm going to go with daylight white balance. Look how much warmer that is. Okay, so the grass is now green. And I'm going to take it down just a tiny bit. Okay, so very blue. This is very, very blue. Very cool. Now I'm going to crop to get most effect with these owls. Okay, so I, remember, I want to lose a lot of this foreground. I like the blurry out of focus foreground here, but there's just too much of it. It's a third of the image. So I'm going to come in. Now, because the owl is looking this way, I want to take off a lot of space on this side. Right? Unfortunately, this giant white thing is here. Right? I would like to leave more space on this side, but I'm not crazy about this giant white thing. Right? So that's kind of the image that I would like to do. Um, let's see if we can get rid of this white thing. So I definitely could get rid of it if I go into Photoshop. I'm just going to do a really crude um, clone here. And I've demonstrated this in other uh, videos. If you clone at a lower percentage, like I did with the fence with the horse earlier, right? If I clone at a lower number, so say I'm at 75% right now, see how it's really almost getting rid of that thing, but not quite, okay? If I go all the way, actually it does a pretty good job, okay? So I'm just going to take it up most of the way. Actually, it does a really good job. So let's go for it, right? And couple other things. I'm not liking this particular stick up here. I want to get rid of that stick. Okay, so let's just get rid of that. Okay, so I see I'm getting that mirrored again. So I'm just going to choose a spot further away. Okay, so you really have to be careful of mirroring when you're cloning. Okay, Don't get the same spot twice. Don't like this stick either. So this one, I might just do a tone down again. Okay, so it's going to pick a spot. And I'm just going to darken it. So not necessarily getting rid of it, just darkening it. Okay. This one I probably will get rid of. And like that. Okay, so quickly we've gotten rid of a couple of distracting things. Right. I still feel like it's a bit too yellow. Let's dial it down. And I'm going to do shift double click on the whites, shift double click on the blacks. Okay, now look what happened, right? If I take that back two steps, look at the green, right? From the original to here, we just changed that by adjusting the camera profile. And now if I do the whites and the blacks, look at the color, right? I can't stress this enough. You don't need to touch saturation and vibrance. In fact, most of the time, I never touch those sliders, okay? I'm going to do a radial filter to darken things outside of the birds, right? So I'm just going to invert that. Okay. Because they're off center, I find that the edge vignette is not going to work because it's going to it's going to be centered, right? 
So that looks pretty good. And I will do an edge vignette, but just keep it low. Something like that. Okay, so look at the difference, right? Now they're kind of lost inside the field versus I've really brought attention into them. And then I could take that one step farther, right? So that radio filter that I created, right? I can also duplicate it by right clicking. Now it's exactly the same spot. I'm gonna invert it, reset it, and then just apply texture. Okay, so now I'm just giving texture to this bird here. I can resize it. Okay. So let's turn it off. Radi no radio filters, radio filters. Okay. They make a huge, huge difference. Okay. So now I'm going to copy my settings, but I'm not going to copy the spot removal or the cropping. Okay, Because that's specific to this image. And I'm going to go to the other owl picture and paste. Okay. Now it's giving me the color and the tonality that I want, but of course the radio filters are all in the wrong place. But I can fix that quite simply and make it smaller. Okay. So I can size up to this owl. And this one needs to be smaller for him as well. Right, then I can go do my cropping. So I definitely don't need all the stuff on the bottom. I don't want that orange leaf. Definitely don't need all this. Now I have two choices here. I could leave this wooden thing over on the right, okay? Because remember how I talked about earlier visual mass and balance? It kind of balances the image. Or I could put him over here, okay? So let's try, see what it looks like with him here, okay? That's not bad. So there's this balance. Okay. versus over here, he's now on the third, right? Now there's just a stick sticking out, okay? So I actually kind of like, like him being over there, right? One other thing that I've noticed that's happening here is that there's a white thing in the background. Let's make this even smaller, right? So this white spot over here. So I'm going to use that healing tool again, make it a little bigger. So see how I've got that at a lower opacity? If I get, I could totally get rid of it, and it blends right in. And I'm using that to get rid of these, these bright spots. Okay, so they're kind of bokeh in the background, but I don't want them to be so bright that they actually take attention away from the bird. Right? Okay. Now there's one right here. Right. Make sure that you line up that stick. Right. So that I'm. Let me zoom in on this one a little bit. So what I'm doing is I'm making sure that the edge of the stick matches. Okay, so I'm just moving it a little bit. And this one, I'm going to go 100%. Okay. So before, after. All right. So we've punched up the contrast a great deal. And I did most of the work on this image. Right? And I was able to use it because it's in the similar lighting condition um, and subject. And then I just adjusted the cropping. So you do want to be careful of cropping images that much because when we go look at the information on this one, okay, uh, this is in the, in the library panel, it shows me that the original dimensions of the image was 4,912 by 3,264 pixels, okay? So because it's an Olympus, it's not a super huge sensor or camera file to begin with, okay? Now the file is only 2,900 by 2,100 pixels. So we've lost 2,000 pixels on either side, okay? So we've lost almost 50% of the image, more than. Sorry, sneezing, <laughs> sneezing and coughing. All right. <laughs> yes, David ARW. Oh, it's a Sony file. Okay, thanks for that, David. I thought that was Olympus. Um, right, you're right. O ORF is uh, is Olympus. Thank you for that, David. Burrowing owls. Yeah, super cute, hey. Um, I think we have them here in Alberta, but I've never personally seen one. So yeah, great, great capture. And I'm sure, you know, you know, they just have this person happened upon 
the owls and you know you got lens what got whatever lens you got right so ideally you don't want to be cropping that much but you know hey if you see an owl take a picture with what you've got right so rob asked everybody how many saw that white spot before i mentioned it i'm assuming you mean that one in the background here that i got rid of um and ron says he did so good job right so if i undo that rob just as a as a test here for you if I go to undo or turn off the cloning filter, okay, the cloning tool, and look at the image upside down, right? So this is the trick that I, I teach in the um, seven composition tips, if you could share that article as well um, for them, Rob. So when you look at an image upside down, you shift your mind into, you shift your mind away from you know what the subject is because you took the picture, right? But when you look at an image upside down, especially even if you back away from it a little bit or squint your eyes. So take a look at this on the screen. I'm gonna take myself off so you can see the image full screen and I'm gonna go even more full screen with this one. Uh, let's see, nope, that's not what I want to do. There we go. Okay, so that's full screen. So take a look at this image upside down like this and squint your eyes at it. Now, where does your eye go naturally when you're looking at it upside down, right? To the white spot. Okay, so if you wanna know how to turn your image upside down in Lightroom, I'm using the keyboard shortcut, command, square bracket. Oops, I have to get over to Lightroom. It's command and square bracket or command control. You can also do it up in here. Where are we? Photo and then rotate. Okay, so that's all I'm doing, really. So I'm just rotating it twice and then rotating it again. And that helps you to see the image. And then this other thing that I'm doing is to get the background to be dark i'm just pressing l which stands for lights out in lightroom so it makes all the tools and stuff those panels disappear right so that you can just see the image okay <laughs> great joke ron <laughs> he likes the upside down trick but of course you're down under you're in australia so of course you would like the upside down trick <laughs> Okay, so I think we're going to stop there for today. We've done lots of little um, critter photos. We managed to get through everything on my list today except this one here um, from Malcolm. So this was another one that came in from the Camera Club last week. I could do a quick edit on Malcolm's. Let's just finish this one up with the critters. So again, this is going to be something similar to what I did with the owls. Okay, so there's lots of busyness, lots of stuff going on around the owl, right? I can do the camera. Let's start with landscape, camera profile. Let's start with some blacks and whites, and then we're gonna crop. So again, the bird is facing left, so I'm gonna take more of the space off the right. And you'll notice that I don't worry so much about aspect ratio. If I wanted to keep it original, you can just lock it. So I'm gonna take some from the right and from the top, because this log is gonna become like this nice leading line that, that leads you to the bird. Then we're gonna do the radio filter trick. So you'll see that how quickly I start doing these things, right? I do a lot of the stuff within two to three minutes. So if I'm doing a basic edit in Lightroom on an image, I literally don't spend more than about two minutes, right? If I'm doing a finished edit, I probably spend 10 to 30 minutes, okay? So then I'm gonna duplicate it, invert it, Add my texture onto the bird, and I'm going to brighten them up a little bit as well. Let's give them a bit more white. So I don't want it on the log so much. Let's just get the bird. Yeah, it's not too bad. Okay, so then we're already on our way to seeing the bird more, right? Looks like he's sitting in the clover patch, which is cool. Right. Now this HSL tool is again really handy because I want to brighten up the bird so I can grab his color. So he's lightning, but I want to give him a bit more color. There he is. Right, And I want to desaturate the greens a little bit, darken them a little bit, right? because now we're getting more 
into um, the birds showing up. Okay, so the forest is getting darkened. We can also shift the hue. So if I want the greens to be a bit more yellow, right, I can go this way. And now we've basically got fall. Okay, so I can create a fall look really quickly. And by going more yellow, the blue of the bird is going to stand out. Okay, speaking of yellow, okay, where does your eye go now? Let's look at it upside down. Okay, where does your eye go? Anybody? I'll just keep talking, right? So there's a few things that grab my eye here, but I'm not going to tell you because I want to hear from you guys in the in the chat. So I've done things to bring the attention into the bird with the radio filters. Okay, we shifted the color profile to have more color and and green. We shifted some of the colors using the HSL panel. Where does your eye still go? Because I was just talking about color. Okay, aha. Yellow spots. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I believe that's, um, it's hard to know who is, is saying that because if you're in the group, if that's Nancy or Trish, I'm assuming one of you two ladies, yes, the yellow spots. Okay, so now these yellow spots, especially behind the bird, are what are grabbing my attention. So I'm going to use that clone and heal tool again and just lower the percentage, okay? This one actually I might get rid of. Now this one I have to be careful of, so I'm going to zoom in more to the bird because I want to want to get him. Let me just turn this green cursor off so you can see where my can you see my my cursor is sort of big there. So I want a not a soft brush. Okay, so I want to make it a little bit smaller, and I want to paint around here because I don't want to get his beak. And let's just see what happens if we do that. Okay, that's not too bad. The other thing I can do is I can try and grab this here and actually make it more green. But you see it's affecting everything in the image. Okay, so I don't want to go too far with that. Let's try one more clone. I'm just going to go, I'm just going to make a big circle. <clears throat> and then I'm going to shift it over to here. And I want to make sure my feather is turned down. So if the feather, if the edge of the brush is soft, it's going to bleed into his beak. Okay, so I'm making a hard edge so I don't feather into the beak. And let's just get that filled in with something green. Okay, let's see how he looks right side up. Not a perfect job. I would probably do a little bit more to perfect that, but we're getting close, okay? But you've got the idea because that's the thing that draw that grabs your attention. Okay, so again, because warm colors project and cool colors recede, the bird, the blue is a cool color. Okay, so you really have to work to get rid of that yellow so that your uh, eye does not go there. Now I could even take the saturation down on the yellow Okay, but you'll see that it's also in the leaves as well. So this is a challenge that I actually have. I'm going to reset this with Lightroom. Is you cannot affect the HSL panel as a as a local adjustment. Okay, what I could do is open this image in Luminar. I'm going to do that in Luminar AI. I'm just going to do it as a JPEG for speed and purposes. Because when you go into Luminar AI, it does have a color panel and it allows you to actually mask that. So I could affect the yellows without affecting all the greens and just paint it into those areas. Right. <laughs> Rob says, you could have asked the bird to move. Well, you know, maybe he wasn't super cooperative, right? If you had some bird seed, by all means. All right, let me see where my Lightroom is at. Probably gonna, my Luminar is gonna open on another monitor. So I work with two monitors. I have a big screen over here that uh, I'm facing with you all. And then I have another monitor on my laptop here. So I often have to move things around for the purposes of, dis of demonstration. Okay, so the tool that I want to use, I'm gonna go straight to it, is color. And you'll notice that there's an HSL panel here, just like there was in Lightroom. Okay, but in here, I can go yellow and I can desaturate. I can darken the yellows. Okay, and I can also shift the hue. So I can shift it to more green. Okay, now see how that's really affecting those yellow flowers. Okay, but I don't want it everywhere. I just want it on that yellow flower. So I'm just going to 
mask it and paint it in there, right? So anywhere I see these yellow little those yellow bits, and now that I'm looking, there's a few more, right? There's one over here. So all of these little yellow bits, I'm just painting in this adjustment. Okay, so see how cool that is. So I can do it just on those things there. Right? There's another tool inside of, of Luminar that's really great, which is the landscape tool. So I can actually give this more of a golden color and I can enhance the foliage, but you can see that it goes really neon. Then I just dial it more towards yellow. Okay, so I'm doing the trick of increase to get your settings and then dial it down. Okay, so let's take a look at what it's doing. Right, so that's what Luminar is doing. The other thing that I might do is apply a misty, mystical filter or, or tool. This one kind of gives a nice blur to the whole image, right? And I might choose to apply it everywhere except on our little birdie, right? So I'm kind of blurring everything. Let's make this thing he's standing on sharp as well, right? Now he's really going to stand out again, okay? So see the difference? So all of the things I'm doing are to really help him stand out. Now these sort of out of focus blobs, let me turn my green pointer back on. These sort of out of focus blobs here do bother me as well. Um, also this one across here. So I might do some work to try and get rid of them, but they don't bother me um, enough to spend an hour on this image. If it was something like the Buffalo where it's a really cool image and you've captured with his tongue sticking out. I don't know if you, if you all saw that, but his tongue was actually sticking out. Um, <clears throat> If you capture something that really know, that really is worth the extra effort, then go the extra mile to do that one. <laughs> uh, so next week, Rob's going to give a tutorial on how to get birds to move where you want them. <laughs> Great idea, Ron. Right? Blue Ren is a little more blue. Okay, so do we want to make him more blue? Uh, we could certainly do that. So now I've done that as a plug-in, right? So... You can see this now image is now back in Lightroom and I can make the blue bluer, right? There we go. Let's give them a bit more blue. All right, by darkening the blues, you see the color gets brighter, right? And maybe let's bring this down a little bit. How's that, Linton? Is he bluer now? Yes, there are many things that are easier in Luminar. Like I could have taken that image to Photoshop and done an adjustment layer and masked it and all these other things as well. But I do find that um, the things that I did in Luminar really quickly with the HSL tool, the landscape tool, and then the mystical, I mean, you saw me do that in like less than two minutes, right? So I think that's where we're going to end for today. Um, let me check my notes here because Rob is sending me private messages. So I mentioned a couple of times this week already that um, some of the images that I used, like the sea lions, were from last week where we did a camera club um, event. So that was Linton's Camera Club, Seaford Camera Club in Adelaide, Australia. If you are a member of a camera club and you would like your camera club's images to be edited as a group, so it would still be on the same time this every week, six o'clock Mountain Standard Time on Wednesdays, but we can have a set of images from your camera club, right? So you can all join in and watch me edit and pick up some great tips on how to edit your photos. So I'm going to leave you all there for this week and I hope you have a great week. Um, it's not too hot here and hopefully the fires in Alberta are out soon, but the one thing that we're anticipating and I'm have my fingers crossed is um, we may have some solar activity on Friday. So you know, I may be out shooting some auroras. Sue me, I'm in Northern Alberta. <laughs> Come up and see us and you'll, you'll get some auroras as well, even apparently in the middle of summer. So thanks for joining in everybody. Please remember to subscribe and to uh, subscribe to the channel and like the channel. If you want to check out Luminar, we do have a discount code. So you can use that link and get $10 off if you decide to purchase Luminar. And I hope to see you next week. Please submit your images and um, send in any questions that you have about photo editing and you may see your images here next week. Take care.